enter into the Lord's presence this evening. Father, we come before you today hungry to know more of you. Help us to desire you and open our hearts so that we can praise you with all that we are. You are merciful and gracious, holy and righteous, and your love covers us again and again. May the words of our mouths and the desires of our hearts be pleasing to you as we sing your praises. May your spirit guide us so that no matter what we're going through, we know that you are far greater. We dedicate this time to you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus is our Savior. He redeemed us and protects us and heals us. The Lord is with us always. In Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. 
I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He knows our struggles. He knows them better than we do. So let's give thanks and present our requests to God in this moment. Let us receive the peace of God because he will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's take a moment to pray to the Lord.
my Prince of Peace. You're my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. One more time. You're my Prince of Peace, Lord. You're my Prince of Peace, I will live my life.
come to you today knowing that you will be the victory in the end. We know that we can put our trust in you. So Father, open our hearts as we go into a time of receiving your words so that we can continue to pour out our worship to you, that we can receive more of you, that we can know more of you, that with all of our lives, all of our hearts, that we will seek to know you more as we draw near to you, Lord. Be with Pastor Frank as he preaches your word. Fill him with your spirit that you may be seen and known and felt here today in him and in all of us, Lord. Help us to know that you are working here in this place, here in this church, in each and every one of us, for we want to know you more, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We lift up this time to you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we're seated, why don't we take a time and say hi to those around us. We've been saying hi to each other all day. Um, I mean, it's a joy. It's, it's really a joy and an honor to be with God's people all day, to seek the Lord's face, to repent, to confess our sins to one another, and to know that just as much as people have offended and hurt us, we've, we've also offended and hurt others. And um, you know, Pastor Brad always reminds me, um, as a preacher, well, at least for me, uh, as one of our preacher, one of the pastors in our church that preaches, I need to have more faith. And actually, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about doubt and Moses' doubt as he continues to receive God's call. And as we were singing, you are holy, I mean, I don't, there are no words to describe how awesome God is, how good he is, how kind he is, right? You are Lord of Lords. You are King of You are mighty God. You're the Lord of everything. You're Emmanuel, right? Our God who is with us. You are the great I am. That's what we'll talk about today. You are the Prince of Peace. You're the Lamb of God who sacrificed for our sins. You are living God. You are saving grace. You will reign forever, past, present, future. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Everything starts with him and everything ends with him. He's our Savior. He's our Messiah. He's our Redeemer. He's our friend. He is our Prince of Peace who has made a way for us to go back to the Father. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that we can approach you, this holy God, and, and just come as we are. If, with our fears, with our doubts, with our insecurities, with our sins, in our fallenness, in our brokenness, yet as we come in the name of Jesus, because of what your son has done for us, you see Christ in us. God, we come today um, broken as we are, um, tired as we are, and we say, Lord, we, we need more of you, and we want more of you. So, Lord, as we go into your word, um, may doubt be replaced by faith. May doubt be replaced by confidence in your word, in your character, in who you are. So, Lord, lead us through the word today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, so last week we did begin a new sermon series. Right? After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, we're wondering and we're asking, God, can you deliver your people from bondage from Pharaoh? And God calls a man named Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. And while Moses, we learned last week, he accepts this call and he begins to take next steps to lead, as we come to today's text in Exodus 3, we actually find Moses doubting. Remember, Moses is still speaking to God through this burning bush that will not burn up. And though he has doubts, what's really amazing and cool is Moses engaged in this conversation with the Lord, with God himself. And this is what today's text reads. And so Moses, verse 13, said to God, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And we'll unpack that a little bit today. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites that the Lord, that the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you because this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Verse 16, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, right, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. And I've seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I've promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt, right? Go to Pharaoh and you tell him that the Lord, right, the great I am, the I am, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him, right? God has to move him. And so I will stretch out my hand, and I will strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform, right? The ten plagues among them. And after that, he will let you go. Not only that. I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians, right? We open the text and you're like, wow, Moses is doubtful. We read it. And you already see in the text that this has less to do with Moses. It has actually more to do with God. With the I am. And as we look at God continuing to reveal his call to Moses, and as Moses grows, he has some doubt, some skepticism, we're going to answer three questions that's going to help us overcome our doubt when God calls us. The first question we'll answer is this. What enables us to overcome our doubt when God calls us? What enables us to overcome our doubt when God calls us? Because last week, we learned the type of person God calls, right? Moses was trained for over 40 years in obscurity as a fugitive through his failure. And now Moses is 80 years old. And you would think, man, 40 years is a long time. Moses, don't you know everything you need to know to be an effective leader, to execute the calling God has given you? But he's actually quite, he's actually not sure yet. And so we're asking what enables us to overcome our doubt when God calls us. It's one thing. We must know God's name. I think it's clear in the text. We must know God's name. And right away, yes, we see Moses' fear of rejection, right? His doubt, right? Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose, God, I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Right? And this leads Moses, his doubt leads Moses to directly ask God, God, what is your name? Right? Who are you? And actually, if you look at Hebrew, Moses is really asking, God, what does your name mean? Right? What kind of God are you? See, but God's name was actually already known to the Israelites. God had already proven himself, right, to to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But Egypt was that powerful, that overwhelming, that brutal. And they've experienced as a nation something they've never experienced before. And they've just forgotten. They've forgotten the God of covenant and the God that they worship. See, but God did not forget about them. And so God reveals himself to Moses, verse 14. So God said to Moses, I am, this is what you're to tell them, I am who I am. This is what you are to say, I am has sent me to you. You know, in Hebrew, that that phrase, I am, actually spells Y-W-W, I'm sorry, Y-H-W-H. In case you, now that I butchered it, Y-H-W-H, what does that look like? It's Yahweh, Yahweh, right? It's called the Tetragrammaton, and it's where we get the, the name Yahweh, right? I am is actually the most proper name of God. It's so sacred, so holy, actually Jews aren't actually allowed to speak and actually say Yahweh, right? It's the same name that actually Jesus would take. In the book of John, when he declares, I am. Do you guys remember? Seven times he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, the good shepherd, resurrection and life, the way, the truth, and the life. I am. 
the true vine, right? This is Jesus' declaration that he is, I am who I say that I am, right? In Greek, it's ego eimi, right? I am Yahweh. I am God amongst you, right? Because we know Jesus was with God at the beginning of time. Jesus was with us here on earth, and we know that one day Jesus will return, right? God in the flesh is faithful in the past, in the present, and in the future, right? So that's why if you guys look at your Bibles, anytime the Lord is used with capital letters, it's a reference to the I am, to Yahweh. And this is why when we come to God, it's not Jesus is my friend. We have to come to God Approaching him in reverence, taking off our sandals like Moses did. He is. I am. I am is literally translated to be, to become. It means that God is self-existent, self-sufficient within himself. That God always was, always is, always will be. Right? He is the Alpha and the Omega as we sang. God's name is unlike any other name. It's absolutely unique. And special. And you're like probably asking, like, what's the big deal? What's, what's, what's in a name? Well, it's a lot because my name is Frank. <laughs> I am. And Frank means forthright, open, and honest. I, I hope that's the type of person I am. But it's funny. My mom once told me that she wishes that when I was born that she was actually more spiritually mature because she actually would have given then me a biblical name. And she was telling this to me. I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And she's like, yeah, like a name like Moses. <laughs> and then she stopped herself. And she's like, oh, you know what? It's probably better that <laughs> you don't have that name because there would be a lot of pressure on you to live up to that name. And so she's like, okay, never mind. Frank's fine. <laughs> well, God says who he says he is. Right? What's in the meaning of a name? Everything. Everything. It's who you are. In revealing his name to Moses. You know what God is telling Moses? Don't you worry. I'm going to live up to my name. To my character. To my plans. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to save you. I truly am he who exists. I, and I truly will be present in the future. And I'll be in every situation to which I'm sending you. Including confronting Pharaoh. Right? So verse 15 says... God also said to Moses, say the Israelites, the Lord, right? I am, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and tell them, the Lord, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me. Moses does not have to doubt. As he leads God's people, he's not representing himself. Moses is representing the great I am. We, as God's people, represent the great I am. And that's why there's power when God's people come together and we look to him. The same God who is faithful to their forefathers, the God of the past, the present, and the future, in the fullness of his character, all the adjectives we can think of, his authority, his power, his reputation. He is the same God who will be faithful to them. And so God tells Moses exactly what to say to the elders, right? And to Pharaoh, like verse 16. Tell them, I've watched over you. I have seen you. What has been done to you in Egypt? And I promise to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And God's reminding them, because I'm sending you, because you're going in my name, don't worry. Don't worry. Right, verse 18? It's the elders of Israel will listen to you. Right, and as promised, the elders would accept Moses as God's representative to lead them. And then together, collectively, they're going to go to Pharaoh, to the most powerful man on the face of the earth, in God's name, and take on this ruthless enemy and ask them, can you please let us out of 400 years? Of slavery. You know, as you guys know, praise in our church for the last couple months has been off the hook. And if you remember a month ago when I led praise, I lost my voice. I was standing here, I lost my voice. Right? It was our second Saturday here. And our encounter with God was something I've never experienced as a praise leader here. 
Because usually as a praise leader, I'm like in this mode of like motivating. You're like, oh, open your hearts to the Lord. Like it, that's what it feels like sometimes, right? I have to lead you. But something happened that day where I didn't have to explain anything. I didn't have to say anything. It was like praise team and congregation. I was like talking to Pastor Brad about it. We were like leading each other. It was really cool. Right? There's this like dialogue in this place. Like we're talking to one another, but not really because we're communing with the Lord. And we're pointing each other to look at God, the great I am, to look at Yahweh. Right? And it felt like in that moment of worship, and it feels like that all the time when we worship, there is no fear, there is no doubt, nothing can shake us as we stand together. And, you, you, you know, I'm, you're worshiping, and I have no voice, but I can't help it. I have to worship because you're worshiping. And I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm worshiping. <laughs> Because you guys are worshiping. It's so amazing what God does in the presence of his people when we're seeking him. And it felt like the walls were going to come down here. And so we see as Moses and the elders go together. They go together to confront Pharaoh, their enemy. And there's this like unity and solidarity as they go in God's name. Because they can trust. They can trust in the great I am. Because you know Pharaoh, he believed he was God. He believed he was divine. And now Moses and the Israelites, they ask him for permission to worship, right? Verse 18, then you and the elders are go to the king of Egypt, right? Go to Pharaoh, say to him, the I am, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And this is what he's told us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, right? They're slaves. They just want some time off. I want to worship the I am. We need to rededicate ourselves and restore our covenant relationship back with God. And what does Pharaoh say? He says, no, right? Verse 19. But I know, God tells them, that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels, right? Who's going to move the hand of Pharaoh? It's God, God himself. So I'm going to stretch out my hand, and I'm going to strike the Egyptians with all the wonders. I'm going to demonstrate my power, and I'm going to perform these ten plagues amongst them. And then after that, he will let you go, right? Pharaoh is going to completely reject God's message and suffer judgment. Moses and the Israelites then can now say, yeah, we can trust God. He is going to deliver us from the hands of Pharaoh. Because we know, we, we know at least on paper, in our heads, God is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is sovereign. He's able to tell them exactly what would happen, right? He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. What God says goes. This is who he is. And so you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to doubt, but you can trust his name. Right? Verse 21, that God goes on to, to tell them, and I'm going I'm to make the Egyptians, I'm going I'm to move the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people. Right? They're going to actually be gracious towards you. So that when you leave, you're not going to go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and, you, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. It's amazing. It's amazing that the God of the universe, that the I Am, will move the Egyptians' hearts to graciously just surrender their silver, gold, and clothes without resistance. I mean, who would have believed it? The plunder here, it's to, to take back what rightfully belongs to them. Because they've been working as slaves. And God has not forgotten them. They're going to be delivered. And then they're going to take the riches of the Egyptians. And they're going to receive the wages they hadn't been paid while they were in slavery. Right? And this is a promise that God made to Abraham. And now he's going to fulfill through Moses. Right? Genesis chapter 15 verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. I don't think we can read this and come to the conclusion that when God calls us, that we have to have everything figured out. Because certainly there's going to be moments when we're not quite sure what that next step of obedience is going to be. But we see God's name completely revealed to Moses. And God's name is completely revealed to us. 
And so we're asking what enables us to overcome our doubt when God calls us. It's God's name. It's the, it's, it's the name of, it's Yahweh, the I am. Which leads us to the second question. Why does God's name help us overcome our doubt when God calls us? Right? Why does God's name help us overcome our doubt when God calls us? Right? Why do we need to know his name? Why does God want us to know his name? You know why? Because it reveals his character and it reveals his plans to us. Right? Because the revelation of God's character and his plans actually helps us overcome our doubt. I mean, what if Moses did not trust God in the I am because he's afraid? I'm afraid, God, of what the elders are going to think of me. Are they really going to believe me? Is Pharaoh really going to believe me and listen to me? Right? I mean, if he was stuck there, then Moses would not have fulfilled his call to lead Israel. And so we're asking, why does God's name help us overcome our doubt? First thing is that it reveals his character. It reveals his character. I mean, look at how God reveals his character of faithfulness. Look at verse 15. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, right, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Right, verse 16, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, right, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. See, as God reveals that he is the great I am, he tells Moses twice, right, just in case he missed it, I am the God of your fathers. And as the I am, yes, I was faithful to your forefathers. I'm faithful to you now. I'm, look, I'm speaking to you. I'm talking to you. And as the great I am, I'm going to be faithful as you go. You don't know what's there, but you're going to go to Pharaoh as I'm sending you. I'm there. Right? And look at how God makes promises to us. Because God has seen the suffering of his people under Pharaoh's rule. Right? Look at verse 16. See, I've watched over you. I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. What is unfair, unjust. And despite their suffering, what does God do? He promises deliverance, right? Verse 17, I have promised. He says it. I have promised. I'm going to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So but this is the thing, right? This deliverance will not come as quickly, maybe as easily as they hope. Right? Verse 19, God says, but I know. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. See, God already knows the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, right? Because Pharaoh thinks he's God, yet God still tells Moses, hey, you're going to go ask Pharaoh, let my people go. And knowing Moses' request to Pharaoh would be rejected and denied. God already knows what's going to take, what it's going to take to change Pharaoh's heart, right? Verse 20, so I'm going to stretch out my hand. And I will strike the Egyptians with all the wonders, right, with all the plagues that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. Again, you know what God's saying? He's like, stop worrying. I am. I will do as I say. I will do as I promise. It's good as done. I see you. I have not forgotten you. I will save you, and I will show my power. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be delivered. You know, one of the things that I share in Discipleship 300 class is that we can be a sinner, a failure, and a disciple all at the same time. I don't know how many of you guys sat through my discipleship class, but anyways, that's what, I, that's what I've been teaching the last couple of weeks. We can be a sinner, a failure, and disciple all at the same time. Because though we struggle with sin, we struggle with failure, it does not negate the promise that we've been created already in the image of God. That Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And so God gave us Jesus. Yes, we, we've sinned, but he gave us Jesus to justify us, to stand in our place, to restore us back to God's image. Because any promise God makes, he is going to keep. That's his character. And there is no one like him. And because God is faithful, because God is a promise keeper, we see how God continues to provide for them. Verse 21. He says, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to move the Egyptians favorably disposed towards his people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. 
Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing with which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. See, when God tells the Israelites that you're going to plunder, again, it's not stealing, it's not ransacking, it's not extorting, it's not this bloodbath. No, all they need to do is ask because God told them to ask and it'll be theirs. Right, and this is what happens when they ask. Exodus chapter 12, which I'm not sure if we'll study it later, but Exodus chapter 12, verse 35 says this. It says, the Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed, right, gracious towards the people. And they gave them what they asked for. And so they plundered the Egyptians. I don't know if that's funny or if that's like cool or it's both. It's like amazing. It's so easy. It was so easy. You know why it was so easy? They just obeyed. It was so easy. Right? All that they had lost, all of those years, it's not all given back to them and more. Right? That's the power of obedience to God's word. Right? Simple obedience. We've been talking a lot about that. One, one obedience at a time. Um, even last night during um, discipleship class, we asked the question, why has God called us out of sin? You know, why has God called us out of darkness? Why has he called us into salvation? Right? And one of the reasons, if you've been through Discipleship 100, you know, right, we're called to love God through our obedience to God, to his word. To which one of the guys poignantly said, it's just one obedience at a time. He's like, I don't know any other way. I don't know any other way, he said. I said, I agree with you, moment by moment, obedience. Right, because even if we have doubt, God is still faithful. Even if we have doubt, he still keeps his promise. Even if we doubt, he still provides. Right? And that's, that's who God is. Right? You see the unity and the continuity of God's character. He's unchanging. He's steadfast. Right? Again, there's like no words. There's not enough words in the English language or in any language in the world to simply say that he is the I am. And so we're asking, why does God's name help us overcome our doubt when God calls because it reveals his character. Not only that, it also does another thing. It reveals his plan. It reveals his plan. We know it in our lives. We look at Moses and we see it here. You know what God never does for us or for Moses? Reveal the entire plan all at once. Right? Instead, God chooses to reveal his plan in parts. Right? It's really hard for us to grasp because we got to know we got to know. We got a plan. We got to know the next five years of our lives. We don't know. We don't even know tomorrow. Verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Right? What does his name mean? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Right? And if you look at this entire passage, all God wants Moses to do is tell the elders, go tell Pharaoh, go tell the people, listen, I've come in the name of I am. Right? It's, it's this thing, you know, Pastor Brad, we talking about it earlier, like this thing called progressive revelation. Right? When it comes to God's plan, he never reveals, reveals everything at once, but just enough for right now so that we would walk in faith, independence of him. Right, just enough for today. Right, and so we know in obedience, we planted at UIC. And now we've come back to replant here at West Loop. And because we started Saturday service, and even the things that we learned at UIC, amazing. Right, we learned that like, wow, Paul is an awesome praise leader. Not that he wasn't good here, <laughs> but there was things that we didn't understand. God told us and taught us about territories. Right? Spiritual forces of evil, it's, it's different there than here. I mean, even here, Sundays is different than Saturdays. I mean, we look at, like, our sister Sharon. Like, Sharon, we all knew you were a great cook. But thank you for sharing your gift of hospitality with us. <laughs> we would have never discovered that. I mean, it's amazing what God does as we go step by step by step. Right? We want to see it all. We want to see the entire picture. We want to see the final product. But God does not do that. And in that way, God's so gracious. He's so wise because he knows. He knows. 
If we knew everything, we're just going to go rogue. We're going to go independent, and we'll be like, I got it, God, <laughs> instead of, no, God, you got it. We need you to get it. You, we need you to lead us, right? Because God just wants us to obey. I mean, would the elders believe Moses? Would they be, you know, would he be able to convince Pharaoh to let the people go? It didn't matter. It didn't matter how Moses or how the elders felt about, about the situation. Like, oh, would, would he listen or not? No, you just have to obey God no matter what, right? One step at a time, right? Verse 16, go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, right? So even here, it's like God's going to take care of all the results, right? Verse 17, and I've promised, I'm, I promise you, because this is who I am. I'm going to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land flowing with milk and honey. Don't worry, Moses, the elders of Israel, they're going to listen to you, right? And then God tells Moses, yeah, ask Pharaoh, allow, you know, allow us to worship. Let us go into the wilderness to worship knowing that Pharaoh would not allow them to worship. God already knows that Pharaoh would not let them go. God already knows that it would take 10 plays to finally let the people go. See, Moses is not the judge of whether the plan was going to work or not. Right, because he doesn't ask why. We always talk about that. He just asks, okay, what do I need to do, God, and how am I going to do it? Right, and the question is, would Moses in God's people obey right even if it doesn't make sense like why even go why even go i can't move his heart yeah of course you can even if the plan's not given in full will you still trust will you still obey god in the one who says i am i am i'm the great i am i am to be to become i am yahweh i mean you're like pharaoh what's your problem because he actually makes it very difficult on himself. He actually has a very easy out. He just needs to obey God through Moses. And he could have just let the people go. Instead, because he believed that he was the most powerful man, he was a god, Pharaoh had to face the wrath and face the judgment of the I am. Right? So instead of like compromising, negotiating, see how much you can get away with, I don't know about you, I think it's just best. It's just easiest to just obey God, right? Knowing Moses and the Israelites will obey, you know what God does? He, he reveals one more portion of his plan. Look at verse 21. He says, I, I will make, right? I'll move the hearts of the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed, right? Verse 22, so you will plunder the Egyptians, right? You're gonna take back what is rightfully yours, right? Because we know that God is the God who moves in the hearts of people. God is the God who convicts. God is the God who convinces. And even when his plan doesn't make sense, we can't do anything else but obey. You know, so when doubt comes your way, again, like, I'm preaching this, or, you know, I'm preparing this, and I look at Moses, and I'm like, I am Moses. Not that I'm great like Moses. I'm like, I'm Moses, because I have doubt. Right? So when doubt comes, don't look inside. Right? There's nothing there. You have to look up. You have to look, you have to look at God. You have to seek the great I am. He's the faithful one. He is the promise keeper. He's the provider. And that's why worship is so important. That's why we pray. That's why we say get in the word so we can find the fullness of God. Fullness of his character, of his being. And when God reveals his plan, just, just obey. Okay? Just do what you're told. Not what I'm telling you, what God wants you to do. One obedience at a time. Because you know what's going to happen? We're going to talk about it next week, Exodus 4. Actually, Moses still has more questions for God. But as we obey, God's going to show us a little bit more. God's going to reveal a little bit more. Okay? And so we're asking, why does God's name help us overcome our doubt when God calls us? Because uh, it reveals God's character. And it reveals his plan. And then number three. Third question, how then do we overcome our doubt when God calls us, okay? First way is this, by understanding our need to grow in our personal relationship with God. How can we overcome doubt without knowing his name? 
How can we overcome doubt when we don't know his character and his plans? So you have to spend time with the Lord. I mean, I'm talking about discipleship a lot because that's, that's what I've been doing for the last two months in church. Right? In D200, we teach you. Hey, this is how you grow in your personal relationship with God. There's six ways. Do you guys remember what the six ways are? Yeah, I know you do. But I'm just going to tell you. Knowledge of the word. Prayer, devotional life. Study of Christian books, right? Discipline, lifestyle. And being giving, right? Being generous. Right? And though Moses has doubts, over a long period of time, we know in obscurity, in his failure, God was preparing Moses to lead. And Moses was growing in his relationship with God. So when God spoke, Moses knew God's voice, right? Verse 13, Moses said to God, God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. As much as I think this message is for the elders and for Pharaoh, I think this is a message directly for Moses too. Moses saying, remember who I am. I have been with you. I have been training you. I have been waiting for this moment. And now you're ready to go. See, the more we choose to relate to the world than to God, well, we're just going to hear the voices of the world. Right? If we're going to relate more to God than to the world, you know what voice will rise up? The voice of God. And so when you're growing in your relationship with God, you don't have to doubt because you understand. You understand the unfailing nature of God. You understand the character of God. But you know what? You can go looking everywhere else. But you know what? Then you're going to keep looking in. And there's going to continually be doubt and insecurity and fear. And you become a prisoner to yourself. You remain trapped. Right? It's actually, probably, it's probably healthy actually that Moses had a little bit of doubt. Moses, Because Moses wasn't the one that's going to deliver the people. It's God. His God is going to do it. Right? And you notice, like, it's, it's Pastor Brad's been saying, it's cool. Isn't it cool? But it's cool. What you see here. You notice that God is so patient with Moses. Right? He doesn't rebuke Moses, like, don't you get it yet? Right? God simply answers Moses' question, right? And they have this relationship with one another. And I was telling Pastor Brad earlier, like, at the D300 retreat today, right? Some of you who came for the first time, I don't know what you were expecting. I mean, I, maybe you were expecting great baking, but you're like, are we really going to pray all day? Yeah, of course. Yeah, but of course we're going to eat. We're going to fellowship. But what's amazing for those that come for the first time, and I think I felt this way too the first time, coming to a retreat where we're going to repent and you're going to forgive all day, you realize how gentle, how kind God is. In our repentance, in our forgiveness. I think it's just simply our willingness to say, God, I'm going to obey. And he's so gentle and kind, and he meets us. Right? Because I, I think before I was like, oh, I'm going to come to this retreat. I'm going to be rebuked for my sin, my bitterness, like my pain, my disappointment, how I've offended others. I'm going to be rebuked. No, but it's like God's kindness just like leads us to repentance. And it's really cool. It's really neat how God does that. Right? He uses the community to quietly convict us, even as we ha have this time of sharing, right? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Right? And that's why some of you, like, go to the retreat again and again and again. But it, it's, it's the way we grow in our personal relationship and our personal connection with God. It's not like Moses received a call from God. And then it's like, okay, God, thank you for the call. I'm going to go now. I'm going to figure this out. No, he has to hear from God over and over again. Remember, progressive revelation. Just enough for now. Just enough to obey. Right? So grow in your personal relationship with God, with the I am. And then second, by realizing that God provides in his perfect timing. Look at what Psalm 18 verse 30 says. It says, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word, right? The I am. That's actually the same word. I am. Yahweh's word is flawless. 
He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord, right? I am, Yahweh. And who is the rock except our God, right? Because God's character and God's plans are perfect, and he provides in his perfect time, right? Verse 16, look at, look at what God says. He says, I have watched over you, and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. Actually, when you read it, like, in Hebrew, it says this. It says, I have watched, watched over you. And I have seen, seen what has been done to you in Egypt. I mean, I can't read Hebrew, but I'm like, if two words are next to each other and they look the same, they're the same. <laughs> and God tells them, don't worry. Don't worry. I've been paying close attention to you all along. Right, verse 19, I know that the king of Egypt, they're not going to let you, he's not going to let you go. I'm going to stretch out my hand. I'm going to strike the Egyptians, and I'm going to perform miracles amongst them, right? I'm going to make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards you, so that when you leave, you're not going to go empty-handed. And now God tells Moses, I'm not done yet. I'm going to stretch my hand. I'm going to strike. I'm going to perform. I'm going to make, I'm going to plunder. It's good. It's done. Right, God knew that Moses wasn't going to be able to do it. We know he can't do it. We know we can't do it. And Moses is warned. Hey, you know what? He's not going to listen to you. But don't be discouraged. Or don't think that I, the I am, will come through. I'm going to come through. And so Moses, he doesn't give up. He just does what God tells him to do. And this is why Paul confidently says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so we're asking, what are we doing here on Saturday nights? Are we done church planting? Are we done expanding? No. Will, will we go out again? Yeah, God's going to send us out again. Because we're called as a church to disciple, to enjoy the grace of God, and to share it with others through church planting. Right? What God started in Moses, what God started in each of us, he's going to finish. And he's going to provide in his perfect way, in his perfect time. Right? So don't be overwhelmed by the task. Don't be overwhelmed by what we don't know. But to just follow God in faith. Right? So we're asking, how do we overcome our doubt when God calls us? First, by understanding our need to grow in our relationship with God. And then by realizing that God provides in his perfect timing. And then one more, by persevering. Persevering in obedient faith. We know Moses did not have all the answers. Our staff, we don't have all the answers. Moses did not know the plan in its entirety. But Moses followed a God who had all the answers. He followed a God who had a plan. Right? Verse 19, God said, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I'm going to stretch out my hand. I'm going to strike the Egyptians with the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. See, we worship a God who has all the answers. We worship a God who has a plan for us. Our God was, he is, he will be, he is the I am. And he's revealed himself into human history, right? He is who he says he is. And again, it has more to do with him than it has to do with us. And so will you persevere in obedient faith? Because God reveals one at a time in progressive revelation his character one at a time. His plan, one at a time. The question is, will you and I, will we obey? Because I know many people that have fallen away from faith. Because they, they never knew God. Right? We all grew up in youth group and in college ministry together. And they never grew in their personal relationship with the Lord. And so they couldn't persevere in obedient faith. They didn't learn to repent and to depend on God. They didn't learn to love God. They were just legalistic and did things for God. Right? There, was, there was all this brokenness, but no one wanted to be authentic. Right? We're called to love our neighbors. We don't want to love our neighbors because we had to protect ourselves. Right? We never shared the hope and the freedom that we find in the gospel. And we're experiencing it together today. And as a result, so many of my friends even friends in ministry. You know, Pastor Brad talks about all the time. Yeah, I have friends too that were in ministry, and they're not in ministry anymore. And they never knew. God called them. God had a plan for them. And that his character and his plans were sufficient. 
that God himself was enough. And now that God has revealed and explained his name, I hope you and I, we don't have any objections, okay, to who God is. Right now, every once in a while, like Moses, you know, yeah, God, are you really there? Yeah, we're going to, of course. But it doesn't change the fact that God says who he says he is. And so we're asking the question, how do we overcome our doubt when God calls us? By growing in our personal relationship with God, realizing that God provides in his perfect timing, and by persevering in obedient faith. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, like looking at Moses for me this week was like looking into a mirror, right? Because like I think a lot of us do, like here I am, God, right? Moses like accepting the call. And then here he is, he's like, but. <laughs> and then for me, it's like, oh, I'm preaching this week. <laughs> like, I don't know if I can do it. Uh, but I'm so grateful. I'm, I'm grateful for our church. I'm grateful for our staff and our team because I, I don't have to study this on my own. We study together on Tuesdays. We, we work through the text together. Because God doesn't want us to do it on our own. He wants us to do it together, and he's going to do it because he's the great. I am. And that's my prayer for our church, that whatever doubt, whatever fear, like, is in your heart right now, you have to run to the Lord. Run to the I am, who's willingly, he's, like, willingly saying, here's my character. This is who I am for you. I am faithful to you. I am good to you. Will you come to me? Will you continue to trust me? I'm a God of promise. I'm a God of providence. I'm a God that has a plan. Don't worry. Will you come? That's my prayer for us as we come. Let's prepare our hearts uh, for communion. Let me pray for us, and then Pastor Brad will lead us in communion. God, like you revealed yourself to Moses, God, help us to know you. You revealed yourself to him. Reveal yourself to us. We thank you that you are the I am that you are Yahweh, the most holy one, the mighty one. You are Emmanuel. You're the living God. There is no one like you. You were, you are, you will ever be. So help us, God, to grow in our intimacy with you, that that we would spend time in the word, that we would spend time in prayer, that we would worship together, and that would be the means by which we understand you and we grow intimate with you. Increase our faith in you, not in man. In you, not in ourselves, knowing that you are faithful. God, help us to persevere in obedient faith. God, Jesus, you I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And show us once again as we take communion that you are fully God. You are fully man, even in Jesus, who declared that he is the I am. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I forgot my iPad today, so I didn't know I was, I, was, I was leading communion. And so if I'm, like, stuttering, it's because I, I can't read it that well. Um, I'm older. So I have to look like this way. Um, but I, I, I hope you enjoyed the message. Um, you know, this is, I think, the first time Frank preached uh, since we had the talk. And, uh, you know, Frank and I talked about a month ago about his calling. And I want you to take away something as we're talking about God's call. Don't ever be afraid to follow God's call even if in your own eyes that God may call you to something more humbler. So, you know, I asked Frank, do you think you're called to be a primary preacher? And he's like, no, actually, I think I'm called to lead praise, do administration, and to preach. And then today I was talking to him, and he said, you know, Brad, I don't know what happened. I finally, I was preach, preach, I was preparing, and all this illustration started coming again. And I said, it's because you accepted your call. Um, I know the last two weeks you were here on the Saturday, those of you really enjoyed my sermon because I was sweating and <laughs> I couldn't get to my point and I didn't know what I was saying. I'm still like, please get rid of all that tape. Don't ever put it up. I mean, I was like, I was like, what's going on? 
<laughs> it's true. Like, if I'm sweating, you're sweating. I know. I told you, in my old age, not only can I not see, I can't stop. <laughs> when I was younger, I'd stop, but I don't know how to do it anymore. But I was praying, and I was saying, Lord, it's unusual for me to struggle, especially when so many people are worshiping. On Saturday, it's a small crowd, but we have very willing hearts. And the Lord was reminding me, you're not called here. This is in preparation for your other staff who's going to plant and go to another place. You're to guard the Sunday. Didn't you know, Brad? And I was like, I didn't know, Lord. So I, because I miss God all the time. So I said, okay, Lord. So I had a talk with the staff on Tuesday, and I said, you guys will preach. And I feel so free. Um, I'll talk about it next week. Um, one of the ways God moves us is through emotion. And uh, don't be afraid to trust, entrust yourself to God, even if you feel like he's taking something away from you. He's not. Um, accept your limitations. Because when you accept it, you become specialized, and God's anointing can come through you in the, in the most powerful way, and there will be no one like you. So don't be afraid to, you know, that's why, you know, Frank, good job uh, revealing God's name. He knows. He is the great I am. We can entrust and just, just follow him, even if it's hard, and even feel like you're going to lose something. You're not going to lose anything because God's going to bless you in a great way. So let me read you because um, in communion, Lord is reducing himself to die on the cross. So uh, Luke chapter 22, right, verse 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So verse 19, I love this verse. I love this verse because, you know, like, you know, we do the inside out class and then everybody's so broken. Uh, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them saying, I'm broken for you. This is my body given for you, broken for you. Another translation, do this. That's why I like NIV 84, this NIV 2020, it, it doesn't do it. Uh, my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then thank you for buying the jewel bread because it's e easy, easy for me to break. Um, I always, I love this. And then for those of you that are 21 and younger, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know your age. I'm not judging. So let's not talk about that. His body is broken for us. I love doing that, especially not with the sourdough, but the jewel bread is easy to break. And then 20, in the same way, after the cup, he took bread, cup saying, this cup is new covenant in my blood. And I always imagine, right? I always imagine. I don't know what happened to our half bottles that Eric Lim gave it to us. They gave me the whole bottle again. I feel like such a waste, but we'll save some. Somebody broke the cork too. But I always think that Lord is like pouring out his blood for us. It's, you got to do it right. <laughs> you can't, I can't be dramatic with this stuff. Okay, so um, some of it falls if you don't break it right. Anyways, um, I feel like Lord, like pouring his blood for you. For you. He has given his body. He has shed his blood for you. I don't know anybody. Even my own parents didn't die for me, so I don't know. But I have a Lord that died for me and says, Trust me, in his progressive revelation, he says, you know what? I'm only going to give you a small picture, and I'm going to give you my name. And I'm going to give you my son who died for your sins. And he's going to be broken, he's going to be poured, and he's, I'm going to ask you to trust. And I'm going to ask you to humble yourself and to trust, and then I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you into greater than you've ever done. And whatever limitations that God is bringing you in your life right now, accept it. So can I invite you? Um, because most of you are in Discipleship 300. I don't have to go through, like, 
you know, are you bitter or that? I hope you took care of that today, okay? So if you didn't after all day, I don't know what to tell you, all right? Maybe, you know, so if you didn't take care of that, I'm sorry. So, but, you know, and I'm, okay, I mean, we gave you all that time. I don't know what you were doing, all right? So, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just, I don't know why I'm like this. Maybe it's like all the hours of like, you know, but if, uh, if you'll come with the, uh, alcohol, 21 and under over here, um, let me, let me, why don't you co well, come this way. And the 21 and under could be, just one person could be over here. And then take your bread and uh, come here, Grace, right here. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. If you're hungry, you can take a bigger piece. <laughs> Don't worry. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his blood shed for me, for you. Let me pray for us. We thank you, Lord, for the special presence, your spiritual presence in this bread and in this wine. And we thank you so much that your broken body and your blood shed for us has given us this community and one another with the great I am. There's no authority, there's no name, there's no one who is above you. And you have blessed us and called us to serve you. We are not afraid. We are so secure. We thank you, Lord, that you are enough. But you bless us even more in our lives. We thank you for that and we give you glory and remember Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We will now enter into a time of giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. You can give on the app, you can give through Zelle, or if you've brought a physical offering, you can leave it in the basket as it passes by. Let's now stand and sing in response to the message and to communion, knowing that we can overcome our doubt when God calls us, because we can trust in Him. Thank you. 
Let's pray together. Lord, we know you are powerful, and you know, we know that you can empower us, and we know that we do not take back. We step forward in faith by your power, and because your name, which is above all name, we can do all things that you have allowed us to do. We do not fear. We move forward in faith. So now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of the Father and fellowship of his Spirit be with this community now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good afternoon, no, good evening. <laughs> Thanks for joining us uh, for worship. Um, just a couple announcements. Uh, next Saturday, we have men's group. Woohoo! All right, for married men or those looking to be married or want to learn what it is to be a godly and Christian husband, make sure you sign up. It's on the app, uh, it starts at 9 a.m. here. Uh, so make sure you sign up for that. I know, I think every one of us has been through Discipleship 100, but Pastor Frank, next Sunday, will be holding a Discipleship 100 class. So if you know of any newcomers or, you know, friends that have been coming to our church that haven't gotten plugged in yet, you know, kind of like mention it to them. Like, yeah, I think it might be good for you to go there. Uh, and then Discipleship 200 will take place 13th, 20th, and the 4th. Make sure you sign up on the app. Well, not you. Those who haven't been. Encourage them. That's what I'm saying. Encourage them to sign up, okay? And that's it. <laughs> what an anticlimactic ending here. Good job, Phil, to ruin it. Uh, let me pray for the food. And maybe, maybe it'll come back. Lord. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful. I don't know why you would reveal yourself to us. Only you, only you know. But you could progressively do it. Help us not take it for granted. Help us to cling to you. Thank you that you haven't given up on us. Thank you that you will fulfill your plan. And so even tonight, as we... Uh, as we enjoy food and company, fulfill your will in our lives. Help us to encourage one another. Go with us as we go home to our families, uh, to our places of rest. Uh, we love you. We want to honor you with our lives. We pray this in your name.